they are monsters. It's just too much already. It's just too much. She was like the sweetest person. She never seemed bad in any way. Uh, baby is pale and blue. They're doing CPR. I just had a baby and it's not breathing. What the neighbor found odd? There was blood smeared on the woman's shirt, but not a trace of blood on her gray shorts. We've all met those people who will take their problems out on everyone around them. Those people where if anything bad happens to them, anything that causes them pain, they want to inflict that same pain on someone else. Those are some of the worst kinds of people to be around. And in today's case, we see the most extreme version of that. A woman who suffered a very devastating loss, who then turns around and causes the worst, most unimaginable pain on another family, all because of her own selfish desires. Cases like today's will never make sense, and the way it went down will leave you with your jaw on the floor. It's such a heartbreaking case that left so many people with such a large hole in their lives. With that being said, let's get right into today's case. Marlene Ochoa Lopez was born on November 16, 1999 in Des Moines, Iowa, but was living in Chicago, Illinois at the time of her death. Those closest to Marlene described her as sweet, compassionate, and kind. She was an angel in the eyes of those who loved her. She was studious and intelligent, always trying her best at anything she put her mind to. She was a young woman with a lot of dreams and aspirations. She grew up surrounded by family who loved her, being described as very close with her family. At the time, 19-year-old Marlene was married to Giovanni Lopez, and together they had a three-year-old son. Obviously, you can tell by Marlene's age that she was very, very young when she had her first baby. Despite her age, though, Marlene was proud to be a mother, and she loved that baby boy with everything she had. She tried her best to be the best mother possible, and her family stood by her side to help her raise her child. Everyone in that household loved and doted over that little boy, and by the time Marlene was 19 years old, she found out that she was going to be welcoming her second child into the world. She was pregnant and so, so excited for the arrival of her second baby. By February of 2019, Marlene, who was seven months pregnant at the time, joined a Facebook group called Help a Mother Out, which was a large page with over 32,000 members created to help out new and expecting mothers gain access to childcare necessities. People would post things that they have to get rid of, such as bottles or baby clothes their child has grown out of. Then others will post requests for things that they need, all in hopes of making some trade-offs and helping each other out. There were some women on there who would get rid of diapers they didn't need or they would sell them at a discounted price. But even beyond that, the woman would post encouraging comments, providing emotional support for other women who were in the same position as they were. It seemed like such a great group for mothers who may not be able to afford certain things, and honestly, it helps decrease the amount of waste babies create by giving away used items to others who can benefit from them. It also seemed like such a warm, welcoming place for women who maybe just needed a bit of emotional support from others who were going through similar things as them. By March 5th, 2019, a woman named Clarissa Figuiora made a post to the group saying, who's due in May and where is the May mamas at? That same day, Marlene had also posted to the group saying that she was looking for some baby items such as a stroller and some clothes for her baby that was due in May. Clarissa responded to the post, and from there, her and Clarissa struck up a conversation in the comments. In the first comment, Clarissa wrote, My girl has all brand new boy clothes her son never wore. Marlon replied, Yes, girl, that's fine. Thank you so much. Clarissa replied, No problem, girl. I know how it is. She was lucky to have two baby showers, so she just loves to spread the wealth. I'm fine with the help. Inbox me for more info, okay? From there, the two sent messages back and forth, planning how to go about getting the baby clothes to Marlene. Now, of course, when you're talking to strangers on Facebook, especially when you're going to be meeting up with them to exchange items, you want to vet them to make sure they are who they say they are. I will note that a page like this can lead to some letting their guard down a little bit because women tend to trust other women. No one is going to think that a new mother has any sort of bad intentions. But still, you want to check their Facebook page to make sure everything's on the up and up. By all accounts, 
Clarissa seemed to be exactly who she said she was. She had posted to the Facebook page multiple times talking about how she was pregnant and how excited she was to welcome her new baby into the world. By December of 2018, she had posted a picture of an ultrasound to her personal Facebook of the baby she was carrying. Then, on February 5th, she posted a picture to the Facebook page of a crib and a decorated room. She announced that she was going to be naming her baby Xander. Plus, Marlin did actually have prior interactions with Clarissa. She had been over to her home one other time to pick up some items, and everything went perfectly fine. There was no reason to think that Marlin shouldn't trust this woman who seemed to just be offering a helping hand. So, the two picked out a time and day to meet and went from there. By April 23rd, 2019, Marlin went to school as normal. After school, she drove her black Honda Civic over to Clarissa's home, expecting to grab those baby clothes from her and return home to her family. But unfortunately, and tragically, that isn't what actually ended up happening. By 6 p.m. that evening, 911 received a call from a woman reporting that she had just gave birth to a child in her home and needed paramedics immediately because the baby was struggling to breathe. Once first responders arrived to the address, they were met with Clarissa Figuora, who was holding an infant with the umbilical cord and placenta still attached. This baby had very clearly just been born and was in a state of obvious distress. Also present in the home was Clarissa's adult daughter, 24-year-old Desiree. Immediately, medics took that baby into an ambulance and began life-saving measures before the baby arrived to Advocate Christ Medical Center in critical condition. Meanwhile, other medics stayed with Clarissa in the home. They asked her if she had any bleeding, cramps, or dizziness, and she said no, but they did order another ambulance for her just as a precaution. After all, she had just given birth and needed to be examined regardless. For the days that followed, this sweet newborn baby remained on life support in the NICU. It was said that the baby had zero brain activity pretty much from the moment he arrived as his brain was severely deprived from oxygen during his birth. Meanwhile, when staff examined Clarissa, they were immediately confused. She showed no signs consistent with a woman who just gave birth. She did have blood on her arms, hands, and across her face, which nurses did clean off of her, but she didn't have any on her stomach or in her vaginal region, which you'd expect from a woman who literally gave birth just minutes prior. Plus, Clarissa was actually 54 years old at the time. Not that it's not possible to give birth at that age, but it definitely is not common. All of this was very strange from the jump, but at this time, obviously no one is going to question her. These strange factors were not the main concern here. She clearly had a newborn baby in her arms when first responders arrived. It's not like she had gone to the hospital claiming to have just given birth, but had no evidence of any baby. She had a baby who was in grave condition, so her physical examination was the least of the hospital's worries. For the weeks that followed, Clarissa and the rest of the family took to social media to talk about the delivery, saying that the baby was in dire condition. They created a GoFundMe page posting a photo of that baby in the NICU, hooked up to breathing tubes, asking for donations to help pay for her son's care. They were hoping to raise at least $9,000 to help with medical expenses. Now going back just a bit to the day after the baby was born, April 24th. That day, Marlin's husband, Giovanni, grew concerned because Marlin never returned home from school on April 23rd. This was very unlike Marlin, who again loved her family, was incredibly close with them, and she had a three-year-old child at home to take care of. Her family knew there was no way she would just run off, so Giovanni reported her as a missing person. But according to her family, police didn't take her disappearance seriously at first. Some family members have been very outspoken about how poorly the investigation was handled at first, saying that they think the lack of concern was because they are undocumented. English isn't their first language, so there was a language barrier there as well. For days, it seemed that police really didn't do much to search for Marlin. That was until around May 7th, when a friend of Marlin's told investigators about the Facebook page Marlin was a part of. The friend had also recently joined that page, and after Marlin's disappearance, the friend noticed the conversation between her and some woman, where Marlin was requesting those baby clothes. 
This prompted police to start looking into Marlene's social media to see if they could get an idea of who exactly she last spoke to and see if she said anything that could indicate where she may have gone. That is when investigators discovered the messages between Clarissa and Marlene, where Marlene agreed to go to Clarissa's home to pick up the baby clothes just one day before she was reported missing. When detectives went to Clarissa's home, they were met with her daughter, Desiree, who told them that Clarissa was in the hospital because she had just given birth. After speaking with Desiree, investigators then conducted a search of the neighborhood. And pretty quickly, they found Marlene's car parked less than half a block away from Clarissa's home. This car stood out to investigators and residents in the area because it had accumulated several parking tickets over multiple days. After finding this car, detectives went to the hospital where Clarissa remained as her baby continued to fight for his life in the NICU. They spoke with Clarissa about Marlene, and she denied that she ever came to her home on April 23rd. But by this point, everything they were finding was pointing them in Clarissa's direction. The messages between them were Merlin literally planned to go to her home, plus her car being parked right down the street with parking tickets which showed that she had been parked there for at least a couple days at that point. Obviously, Marlin had met up with Clarissa and Clarissa was lying about something. At this point, detectives started gathering DNA samples from Clarissa Desiree plus Clarissa's live-in boyfriend, 44-year-old Peter Bobak. They also subpoenaed the hospital records for that baby. They compared the baby's DNA to Clarissa's and they confirmed that this baby was not Clarissa's child. Using DNA extracted from Marlin's toothbrush and hairbrush as well as DNA taken from Giovanni, they determined that Marlene was actually the mother of this baby boy, and of course, Giovanni was the father. Obviously, this news was just devastating, yet relieving at the same time. At this point, Marlene's family had no idea where Marlene or her baby were or what happened to them, fearing the worst for the both of them. And now, they at least knew where Marlene's baby was, even if he was in critical condition in the hospital. They started visiting this precious angel, hoping for the best possible outcome, holding on to hope that this baby could pull through. At this time, the family named the baby after his father, Giovanni Jadiel Lopez. After this, by May 14th, police were able to obtain a warrant to search inside Clarissa's home, and what they found there just confirmed everyone's absolute worst fears. When they first arrived to the home, they found Clarissa's boyfriend, Peter, cleaning off a rug outside with bleach and a hose. As soon as this man saw police, he immediately dropped that hose and walked off. Then, all throughout the home, they found what they believed to be spots of blood. They also found bleach and other cleaning solutions, clearly indicating that there was blood all over the house and they attempted to clean it up. Then, in the backyard of the home, detectives found a garbage bin. And once they looked inside, they found the body of 19-year-old Marlene Ochoa Lopez. Along with her body, they found a coaxial cable, which they believed was the weapon used to murder her. Then they found remnants of Marlene's clothes, which had been burned. Nadia Herrera speaks about her friend, Marlene Ochoa. She was like the sweetest person. She lit up the room when she walked in. The pregnant missing mother was last seen on April 23rd. That's the same day a 911 call was made from this Scottsdale home, saying a newborn was in distress. A neighbor who didn't want to go on camera told me a woman living here ran outside holding a newborn in her arms, saying, I just had a baby and it's not breathing. What the neighbor found odd? There was blood smeared on the woman's shirt, but not a trace of blood on her gray shorts. Uh, baby is pale and blue. They're doing CPR. Herrera says Ochoa has always been a very loving and trusting person. She never seemed bad in anyone. Like she would be like, if someone would say something to her, she wouldn't really take it to her. She would just be like, be like, okay, but she would try to see the good in everyone. After the discovery of Marlin's body, she was sent off to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. There, it was confirmed that Marlin had been strangled to death with that coaxial cable. Then, after her death, her abdomen had been sliced open and her baby was removed. 
At this time, her manner of death was determined to be homicide. Finally, by May 16th, Clarissa and Desiree Figueroa were arrested and charged with first-degree murder, aggravated kidnapping, dismembering a human body, as well as concealing a homicidal death. Meanwhile, Peter Bobak was charged with two counts of obstruction of justice and one count of concealing a homicide. By June 26th, both women pleaded not guilty to their charges. They are monsters. It's just too much already. It's just too much. Scared to show their faces or reveal their names, the adult twin daughters of Clarissa Figueroa described the horror after learning that their mother and half-sister Desiree allegedly murdered a woman, took her baby, and tried to pass it off as her brother. Oh, my mom goes, do you want to see your baby brother? That was April 24th, the day after they say mom Clarissa called to say she had a baby. The twins say they hadn't seen their mom in nearly a year, but they did keep in contact with her over the phone. So you walked, you and, walked, you yeah. moved around the labor and delivery. Yeah, care. I was in the, problems. yeah, well, any problems. I just went in her room. The room she's referring to, labor and delivery at Advocate Christ. The sister says her mom stayed there for three days, accompanied by her boyfriend, Peter Bobek, who they confirm is seen in these pictures. One sister says she visited her mom two days later on April 26. I seen the baby and I touched the baby and I didn't think of anything about like it wasn't my brother because my mom said it was my brother. Both women say they grew up in an unstable home and were neglected by their mother. I was a, a teen mom at the age of 16. I lived on my own since then. Tonight, both sisters admit they had doubts. They should have checked my mom. They should have made sure that the baby was her mom. Like if they knew that her tooth were tied, why didn't you double check? Like why didn't you check if that was her baby? The twins say they will not be able to forgive their mother and sister and sent a message to the Ochoa family. I want to tell Marlene's family that I'm so sorry for everything that they're going through. Now, as these women were facing their charges in court, little baby Giovanni was fighting for his life in the NICU. But as I stated before, it was determined pretty quickly that he did not have any brain activity. And about a month after Marlene's death, Little Giovanni also died from his injuries. His brain was deprived from oxygen for too long to survive. Of course, Marlin's family and Giovanni's father are all absolutely devastated. The one ounce of hope they had was now gone. These two selfish, disgusting women ripped two family members away from them, and that is just unforgivable. Now, as these three individuals were sitting in jail awaiting their upcoming hearings, Desiree ended up speaking with investigators, and she confessed to her role in Marlene's murder and told investigators everything they needed to know. Desiree started by saying that Clarissa actually had another son, a 20-year-old who had passed away in 2018 due to natural causes. I'm not sure what exactly that means, 20-year-olds don't just die randomly, but my guess is that he had some sort of illness that led to his premature death. Obviously, this deeply affected Clarissa and could explain her decisions and actions. After the death of her son, by October of 2018, Clarissa announced to Desiree and Peter that she was pregnant. This really surprised Desiree because again, not only was Clarissa 54 years old, but she had also previously had her tubes tied. Nevertheless, Clarissa continued to tell people she was pregnant and started to prepare for the arrival of a baby. By December of 2018, as I mentioned earlier, she started posting ultrasounds to her Facebook, announcing her pregnancy to the world. And again, in February of 2019, she posted the completed baby room and crib to the Help a Mother Out Facebook page. By March 5th, Clarissa posted to the Facebook page asking who else is due in May, which did get some responses. It was also at this time when she started speaking with Marlene about giving her some baby clothes. Of course, the thought is, is that she wanted to find someone who was giving birth around the same time that she was supposed to based on when she announced her fake pregnancy. That is why she made that post asking who is due in May. Other women who met Clarissa through that Facebook group eventually came out and spoke about their interactions with Clarissa during this time. There was another expectant mother who was supposed to give birth in May who messaged with Clarissa about getting some formula from her. 
In those messages, Clarissa was always insistent on the woman coming to her house to meet up for the formula. This ultimately fell through, and thankfully, this woman never went to that home. But she can't help but think that Clarissa was planning on doing the same thing to her as what she did to Marlin. Either way, just before April 1st, 2019, Desiree told investigators that Clarissa came to her, saying that she needed help with killing a pregnant woman and taking her baby. April 1st was the first time they invited Marlin over to the home to grab some items. When she was there, Clarissa, Desiree, and Desiree's boyfriend were all at the home. While Marlin was there, apparently Clarissa pulled Desiree aside and told her that they needed to kill Marlin. But Desiree said no and immediately told her own boyfriend. After this, Desiree, her boyfriend, Clarissa, and Marlin were all in the basement together. While there, Desiree's boyfriend noticed Desiree and Clarissa acting strange. They were keeping very close to one another and both kept going in separate rooms. It even looked like Desiree was shaking. Desiree's boyfriend went to her and told her that he was going to call the police if they were actually planning on killing Marlin. Eventually, they did let Marlin leave, and once she did so, Clarissa told Desiree's boyfriend that it was just an April Fool's joke. No one was killing anyone. Just a little lighthearted joke. Then, as we know, by April 23rd, Marlin drove her car over to Clarissa's home for a second time to pick up some more baby items. Once there, Marlin sat in the living room on the couch. At that point, Clarissa and Desiree turned up the music and went to the kitchen together, where they discussed their plan to kill Marlin and cut the baby out of her stomach. This time, it was just Clarissa and Desiree home, so there was no one there to stop them. Once they returned to the living room, Desiree distracted Marlin by showing her a photo album of Clarissa's late son. As Marlin looked at the album, Clarissa came up behind her and wrapped a coaxial cable around her hands and then wrapped it around Marlin's neck. As Clarissa started strangling Marlin, she did manage to get her fingers between the cable and her neck in an attempt to stop Clarissa from strangling her. At that point, Clarissa yelled at Desiree, you're not doing your effing job. Desiree then stepped in and started to peel Marlin's fingers off the cable one by one. Once her hands were fully removed, Clarissa tightened the cable around her neck before sitting on top of her to continue the attack. Altogether, the attack lasted four or five minutes. During that time, Marlin was absolutely fighting for her life. At one point, she reached out and touched the dog before she stopped moving. After those five minutes, Clarissa told Desiree that she felt confident that Marlin was dead. Once Marlin was gone, Clarissa told Desiree to grab a blanket, a large plastic bag, and a butcher knife. After retrieving those items, she gave them to Clarissa and left her alone to finish off the job. At that time, Clarissa cut Marlin open from side to side, so horizontally. She then removed the umbilical cord, followed by the placenta, and then removed the baby from Marlin. She then placed the baby and placenta into a bucket with the umbilical cord sticking out of the bucket. After this, Desiree returned and helped Clarissa wrap Marlin up in a blanket before putting her in a large plastic bag, being sure to tie it tight. She then carried the heavy bag out to the backyard where she dumped Marlin's body inside a garbage can. By that point, Clarissa finally called 911 to inform first responders that she had just given birth and needed help because her baby was unresponsive. As that was happening, Desiree went into cover-up mode. She grabbed Marlin's cell phone and her car and drove to her sister's home to grab two additional cell phones, probably for her and her mom to communicate without there being damning evidence on their regular phones. This was actually captured on a red light camera, which clearly showed Desiree driving Marlin's car. It was also shown that Marlin's cell phone pinged in the same area of the sister's home at the same time. Eventually, Desiree threw out Marlin's cell phone to get rid of it. She then returned home and parked Marlin's car about half a block away from the home. Very lazy if you ask me. She was clearly trying to dump the car, but she also didn't want to walk too far, so she was like, yep, yeah, that's far enough away. That's good enough. Then, as we know, sometime after Marlin was reported missing, police investigated the home and found Marlin's body, as well as the evidence of blood all throughout the home. 
They also confirmed that Marlin's baby had been violently ripped away from her, quite literally, after she was strangled to death. Now, at this point, it's clear that Clarissa attempted to fake a pregnancy with the plan that she would find a pregnant woman and steal her baby. She would even time it correctly to make it look like it was her own baby based on when she announced her pregnancy. Somehow, she got her daughter to go along with her delusional ass plan, and they carried it out together. It was said that throughout this, Clarissa tricked Peter into thinking that she was pregnant and that she delivered that baby. Now, I do believe that she probably did tell him that she was pregnant, never telling him otherwise. I don't think he knew of the plan to kill a mother and steal her baby. However, after Marlin's death, he was caught helping cleaning up the scene. So I do think that at that point, he knew what happened or at least suspected it. And that is why he was charged with concealing a death and with obstruction. For the four to five years that followed, all three defendants sat in jail awaiting their trials. Of course, things got very delayed because this all happened right before the COVID pandemic. And as we know, that pushed back court cases for years. But finally, in 2023 and 2024, we saw some movement in this case. By January of 2023, 44-year-old Peter Bobak actually pleaded guilty to one charge of obstruction of justice in exchange for the prosecution dropping his other two charges. For this, he was sentenced to four years behind bars, but with time served, he only had to serve around four additional months after his plea. He has since been released. Then, the following year, in April of 2024, Clarissa also pleaded guilty to her charges of first-degree murder, with the remaining charges, I believe, being dropped, which is just kind of ridiculous in my opinion. But for this, she was sentenced to 50 years behind bars. Then finally, by May of 2024, Desiree also pleaded guilty to Marlin's murder. For this, she was sentenced to 30 years behind bars. Both women apologized at their hearings, saying that they wished this never happened and they regret what they did. Today, justice was served for Marlin and baby Yadiel Lopez. A sense of relief after years of anguish. Today, again, we say thank you to the Cook County State's Attorney. On Tuesday, Clarissa Figueroa changed her plea to guilty nearly five years after she was charged with the April 2019 murders of Marlene Ochoa Lopez and her baby boy. Prosecutors say Clarissa and her daughter, Desiree, lured the 19-year-old mother to their home with the promise of baby items for her unborn son. They say Clarissa then strangled the 19-year-old and cut her baby from her womb in an attempt to pass him off as her own. The baby boy passed away in June of 2019 after weeks on life support. A pastor working with the victim's family says they agreed with the plea agreement because they did not want to relive the horrors of the crime in a trial. It's time for them to move forward. And again, there's nothing that's ever going to change the reality of the violent actions. Figueroa was sentenced to 50 years in prison shortly after changing her plea. She was given credit for 1,799 days already served. As part of a plea agreement, she was only sentenced on the charge of first-degree murder. Loved ones of Ochoa Lopez were able to deliver victim impact statements through the help of interpreters. Her husband wrote that even if Clarissa were locked in prison for eternity, it would never be enough for what's been done to his wife and infant son. He says that he that he got justice for his wife today, but that he walks out of that courtroom without his family. Now, to me, I don't think these charges are near enough for what they truly did. I think they both should have been charged with two counts of first-degree murder, either that or one count of first-degree murder and one count of, like, reckless homicide or something along those lines for what they did to that baby. Let's not forget that two lives were lost because of what they did. It wasn't just Marlin, but it was her baby who was ripped out of her after being strangled to death. 
the fact that these women just get to live behind bars and Desiree has a chance of being released in 30 years, it's just infuriating to me that these two women get to live knowing what they did, knowing that they took two lives away from a family who loved them. I also want to note that in such a disturbing turn of events, Desiree was actually pregnant at the time of Marlin's murder and she gave birth in jail. Her baby survived and is doing well according to any reports that I could find, which to me, having a baby is always a good thing. But knowing that Desiree was pregnant just makes me so angry knowing that had Clarissa just waited, she could have been the best grandmother to a brand new baby in the family. She could have had the baby she wanted all along and spoiled that baby like a grandmother should. But instead, she decided to target a vulnerable young woman and destroy so, so many lives. Of course, after the plea deals were made and each defendant was sentenced, Marlon's family was and still is devastated. They let their feelings be known in court, telling both women that their apologies will never be enough. Now, Marlon's oldest is left without a mother and without his baby brother. A husband and father is left without his wife and without his son, and the family is left without their daughter and sister and their grandchild, both of whom they loved so, so deeply. Both Marlin and her baby deserve to live long, happy lives, but that was ripped away from them because some selfish, evil woman felt entitled to a baby that didn't belong to her, all because she was dealing with the death of her own son. I do think that that's what caused all of this. I think that could partially explain her actions. Obviously, she was not mentally well, but... I think that it was because she couldn't deal with the loss of her own son. So instead of taking that pain and using it to be a good grandma and a good mother to her remaining children, she decided to inflict the worst kind of pain on a whole other family. I will never understand why she did what she did, and I will never understand how people like this even exist. I don't know what she planned on doing with that baby once it was born. I think she had this delusional thought that she would raise this baby and just live a life with Marlene in the trash behind her house. Clearly, even though she planned this whole thing over the course of months, it wasn't a good thought out plan because strangling a mother is obviously going to cause the baby to be deprived of oxygen and cutting into an abdomen and ripping it out like that is obviously not a good way to deliver a baby. Then to just throw a whole human body in the trash and leave it there? They literally left Marlin there for like two weeks before she was discovered, not bothering to dispose of her or get rid of her body in some other way. Clearly, they're not very smart people. They deserve every horrible thing in life, and I certainly hope that they are not having a good time in prison. That is all I will say about that. But with all of that being said, that is all of the information we have on today's case. My heart absolutely goes out to Marlin's family who suffered the most unimaginable, painful loss. I can't even begin to imagine what they've gone through, but I hope that as time passes, they can live on knowing that they will carry on Marlin and Giovanni's legacy with them forever. But now, I want to hear your guys' thoughts on this case. Do you believe the confession Desiree gave about her mother being the main driver in this murder? What do you think the plan was after this baby was born? Do you think they even had a plan? What do you think drove Clarissa to do this? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.